At St. Andrews, I taught mostly natural hazards and natural resources to first year introductory classes of geology and, and all other majors, and then also to seniors and master's students. And in both those introductory and those upper level classes, uh, I liked to introduce the semester and the topic by asking the audience, tell me what motivates you. What are, what are the biggest, the grandest, the, the grand challenges that humanity faces? And actually, I encourage you to do this thought experiment in, in the classes you teach. And in general, students every year come up with the same eight, sometimes nine or ten challenges. And we've already been exposed to many of these today and, and in the previous talks yesterday. So I'll, I'll go through them. But if you will, take maybe a couple seconds to imagine your number one problem in your mind and, and see if you think it's on the list. Students always say climate change, and, and we've certainly been exposed to that a lot uh, throughout the conference. Disease and health is much more in people's minds now than it was 10 years ago. Energy, and by energy, crises and challenges. I don't just mean electricity, I mean heat uh, and the use of heat. I also mean raw materials that energy creates, such as petrochemicals, and the use of um, catalysis in, in almost all chemical reactions. Food, water, uh, scarcity and provision, freedom, happiness, natural disasters, and here I've listed what I believe are all of the natural disasters that exist. <laughs> Volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, flood, drought, and you begin to see there's a little bit of bleed through between the food and water security uh, category and natural disasters. War and peace, and of course that has some interplay with freedom and happiness. Wealth and development, okay? People say I'm concerned with poverty, and, and, and you can say it's equivalent to saying I want people to accumulate and be able to use wealth. Uh, I want countries to develop so they enjoy the same things we enjoy in, in, in the developed world. And then sometimes people have some sort of world-shattering existential hazard like an alien invasion or a meteorite impact <laughs> or dark matter. If dark matter were to come and hit us now, there would be a, a hole somewhere between the size of my fist and the size of a basketball straight through me into the ground for about a mile. Uh, some of these obviously are more uh, immediate risks than others. <laughs> but what I point out, and I don't think there is any other grand challenge that humanity faces that can't be categorized in one or another of these uh, topics. I'd be curious if you can think of any. Uh, tell me after the talk. All of these involve earth and environmental science. Many of them centrally, some of them peripherally, but it's actually a, a wonderful and empowering thing to do to students early in their education to say, the science that you are embarking on in this class, maybe in your careers, uh, has tremendous leverage on everything, anything that everyone and anyone cares about. But, of course, the human impacts of these topics also involve other sciences. We've seen that abundantly in this conference and also experts beyond science, engineers, and of course, impacts in the real world, which means social sciences and humanities and, and, and all manner of uh, other human endeavors. So that is to say, as was hinted in the Great Lakes talk, environmental projects, problems and solutions are complicated, uh, necessarily and, and, and intrinsically so. And that's a challenge that makes many of them uh, have significant risks of turning out unsuccessfully. I want to walk you through two uh, particularly well-known unsuccessful renewable energy projects. Um, I've done a lot of research in the geothermal energy field. The idea is that uh, if you drill a mine in the ground or even uh, uh, bury, um, uh, bury some meat uh, foot underground, it will stay uh, warm because the earth gets hotter as you go down toward, uh, toward the mantle, uh, generally at about 30 degrees per kilometer, okay? Sometimes less, sometimes more. And there are two magic temperatures. Once you get to about 160 degrees, that can easily be boosted up to create steam running turbines. And once you get to about 225 degrees, turns out you can attach it again to a power plant and create electricity. Okay, so hot water or hot gas produced at 160 to 220 degrees produces geothermal power. 
And it's essentially a long-term, almost limitless, because the Earth is huge, renewable uh, energy resource. Rwanda uh, is one of the countries in the world that is gifted and cursed with volcanoes. Uh, Rwanda, of course, um, derives a fair bit of ecotourism uh, attention out of uh, Virunga National Park. This is one of the gorilla reserves. Um, and other countries, uh, including the USA and California, and famously Iceland and New Zealand, get a great deal of geothermal energy out of active volcanic fields, which of course are particularly hot at particularly shallow levels. So Rwanda wanted to do the same thing. They drilled two wells, one and three kilometers deep, that both turned out to be dry and cool in 2013 on the, on the flank of the Karasimbi volcano outlined uh, here in red. This is about 40 kilometers from Kabali, which is just off the map, the capital city. The prospecting had been done uh, by the Geological Survey of Rwanda in, in concert with a number of international development uh, geological survey organizations and was based on inverse geophysics, electromagnetic methods, magnetotellurics, about a hundred different induction soundings, and sampling hot springs, which of course are telling you there's something hot at some shallow depth, uh, for chemistry, which was supposed to indicate the depth at which those hot springs were being sourced in the temperature. And here, in this cross-section, you see the Karasimbi volcano itself. You see the edge of the African Rift Valley, which is controlled by, as these people uh, hypothesized, straight faults that went straight down. You see rainwater that falls on the ground and recharges the aquifer and then rises above the magma body, which is located about three to five kilometers underneath the volcano. And then in the colors, you see the natural temperature of the Earth. And so the idea was to move to the flank of the volcano out here and drill these two wells that would intersect the fault, so a highly permeable um, damage zone, uh, in which you could extract the hot water at about two kilometers depth. Okay? Two kilometers is, is a reasonable depth to drill a, a drill hole. Uh, but in the end, both these holes failed, and, and the reason is probably that there wasn't enough geology done. There were not seismic surveys done. Uh, probably it would have been more successful drilling close to the volcano, trying to tap uh, something underneath this impermeable zeolite cap where the actual magma chamber heat source itself. And in fact, very, very few faults are straight, planar features that go down to depth. They tend to be anastomosing fracture networks which makes them very easy to miss when you're at the surface trying to intersect them two kilometers down. So um, Rwanda spent about $31 million on this uh, in terms of Vatican Observatory budgets or NASA budgets. Remember, a half percent of the annual budget has been quoted to us for both. This was about 2% of Rwanda's annual budget for that year. Uh, and a similar amount was spent uh, by the other partner organizations. After which, Rwanda said, okay, now let's develop an actual formal geothermal strategy. And they are continuing to explore, but, but this, this stunted um, uh, investment in geothermal in, in Rwanda, certainly, and, and in other places, Rift Valley, for many years. Um, Rwanda was not alone at that time. Here is a heat map of the deep Australian crust and the biggest geothermal exploration failure to date, um, which I'll talk about in a minute or two. So uh, this is a map, uh, red is hot, 235 degrees, easy electricity production, and dark blue is about 85 degrees, 160 is sort of your green to blue transition, where you can begin to get steam for electricity at five kilometers depth. Now five kilometers is not an easy drill core to drill. Two kilometers, no problem. Five, much more difficult. Uh, throughout Australia, this is extensively sourced. Here you see confidence maps, which is good practice by a variety of geophysical methods. Uh, and so there is here the ancient Australian craton where it's actually quite cool. You only get about 15 degrees per kilometer you go down. And here is um, uh, a coal basin, great artesian basin, let's say, where for a variety of reasons, including radioactive granites down at five to six kilometers, and uh, thermal lids of the coal beds above, you're accumulating a lot of temperature at uh, a relatively moderate depth. 
Okay, and um, a company came along, Geodynamics Limited, that said if we drill right here in the middle of the Great Artesian Basin, we think three or four, maybe five kilometers down, we can produce 10,000 megawatts of electricity. Uh, and, and this attracted uh, more than $500 million of investment, uh, spawned another 15 country, companies in Australia who got another $500 million of investment for about 13 other projects throughout Australia. But the problem was that same location here where the heat is highest is very far from where anyone lives in Australia. This is a population density map, uh, and this color of orange is between 1 and 10 people per square kilometer. So you can see we're about 400 kilometers uh, from that geothermal heat source to where we begin to get a couple people living uh, uh, per square kilometer. And so, in fact, they drilled uh, six different wells, generally about four kilometers deep. Several of the wells failed because it got too hot, so the, the drilling metal literally fused together and melted in the drill core. Uh, friction, of course, is also increasing the heat. They learned things about how to drill, uh, but several of the wells did produce hot water and steam. Here you see exploding out of the, this might be Habanero 1. Uh, hot pepper was the name of one of their... Uh, sites, and they produced about 10 megawatts of electricity to test it out, and then they realized that they were too far to profitably bring this electricity to any kind of market. And so uh, they did shut down. Geothermal Project closes in South Australia. Here, Australian uh, government geoscience uh, organization writes, the successful drilling of the Habanero wells reflects the vast experience that's been gained in this project. These learnings have come at a high cost, in excess of a half a billion for this project, another half a billion for the others, but will provide the basis eventually for making geothermal energy possible. So there's a billion dollars down. Now, a billion dollars is a lot of money. At the same time, for comparison, uh, some of you may be aware that the biggest solar power plant in the United States is a bit southwest of Las Vegas. You may have seen it in, in movies or documentaries. It's about two and a half miles by two and a half miles of solid solar panels called the Copper Mountain uh, Prospect. Costs about $3 billion, produces about 228 megawatts of electricity. So, you know, the risk reward is not unreasonable. It's just that in many of these cases, the, the, the product does not come to fruition, and, and that is unfortunate. Let's go to successful geothermal power here in Kenya. Rift Valley uh, target as well. There have been a number of successful geothermal power plants installed, making up about 25% of Kenya's modern uh, power generation. Another 25% is hydropower. The rest is uh, diesel combustion that has to be brought in because uh, there is no significant oil and gas production in Kenya itself. Um, but the difference here, you see the prospect, is they are literally drilling inside the caldera of recent, by recent I mean 10,000 year active volcanoes. Okay, there's steam coming up, you're on the volcano itself, not 10 kilometers off on the flanks trying to intersect a lucky fault, and, and so they do get all sorts of hot water coming up producing this electricity. And in a very beautiful um, exemplar, all of these geothermal power plants also do what's called direct use of heat. And this is to say, along with this electricity, the steam is being produced. You have a lot of heat. They capture that steam, and they feed it into greenhouses. They grow about $20,000 of uh, red peppers and tomatoes there. Turns out that the steam has intrinsically a lot of cations because it's geothermal liquid. Uh, it's basically like fertilizer liquid. Uh, you can also do things like run laundromats, do chemistry alongside these power plants, and so you distribute the economic activities from just electricity generation at a giant national scale to local scale uh, entrepreneurship activities as well. Grow catfish in ponds. Turns out catfish grow really big in warm, uh, nutrient-rich water. A little further south in the Rift Valley in Malawi, we're going to change to a hydroelectric power. Now, when we think of hydroelectric power, and I mentioned uh, Kenya gets about a quarter of its power from hydroelectric, you think of big dams. Hoover Dam produces 25% of the electricity for Las Vegas every year still. 
Big dams and dams, of course, also come with their own environmental problems. Salmon fisheries have been mentioned in yesterday's talk. But an alternative um, to big dams is what's called micro hydro or mini hydro, off grid dams. And this says if you have a farm with a mountain and a, and a, a, a river or a stream coming down it, maybe you make a wee little dam and you produce um, you know, a similar amount of electricity to a windmill on your property for, to run your farm with. Or here um, in Malawi, down near Malanji Mountain in the southern tip, the electrical grid has not reached this location. That is a problem. This is a very politically sensitive location in Malawi, uh, near, uh, nearly surrounded by the Mozambique border. And for a variety of reasons, when there's political instability in Malawi, this is, um, this is often a place where, where it's centered. So it's unfortunate that there's no electricity, no provision of, of power to hospitals. Um, at this location, and uh, most of the economic activity comes from tea plantations. Actually, in, in my opinion, uh, uh, the finest tea in Africa uh, and some of the finest black tea in the world comes from Lujiri tea plantation at the foot of Mulanji Mountain. And you can see there are rivers coming down here uh, that would have a whole lot of gravitational potential energy to use for hydroelectric. So um, Strathclyde University, an engineering school in Scotland, has attracted about $20 million of investment over about 10 years' time. And they've built a number of mini hydro plants by diverting the Lechenya River through uh, plastic and copper pipes, as you see here. It turns a turbine just located in the footprint of that little house there. You have to then build your electricity poles and your wires, and it, it, it electrifies uh, about 80 homes nearby uh, for that $20 million investment. Uh, and that is very significant to people in that community in those 80 homes. Now recently, Malawi has privatized its power, uh, its electricity generation sector so companies can come in and try to build new power lines, build new plants of any variety and so forth. And unfortunately, because there's now electricity off-grid at, at Lujiri, uh, the initial decision was not to build the grid in that direction. For, and there are many more people in 80 houses in that area because there's already off-grid and they're already expanding it. Um, so that's an example of an unintended consequence, uh, of course. But eventually, I think the grid will reach down there and there's the potential to feed this in for about $150 per megawatt hour, which would mean the investment would be made back in 30 or 40 years from a power plant of that scale. Um, there are other unforeseen consequences. Strathclyde University is full of excellent engineers, but does not have a geology department. And so many of the dams retaining water in Lachenya River are built like this around giant boulders. These giant boulders have lichen on all different sides of them because they're moving around in wet rainy season storms. And, and those retaining walls will break uh, probably shorter than 30 or 40 years. But nonetheless, um, I've pointed out here four renewable energy projects with noble ambitions, but each one had perhaps some aspects that weren't as successful as wished. Some were more successful, some were, were less. And these go to show, as I suggested in the initial slides, the potential power of Earth environmental science is wide and deep, but the pitfalls are profound because it's such a complicated integrative science. And don't get me wrong, it's easy to throw criticisms at something, okay? It's not the critic who counts, the credit belongs in the arena, there's no effort without error and shortcoming, uh, and that's absolutely true. But at this stage, I think it would be useful to introduce a buzzword, said nobody ever, uh, but it's what I'm gonna do anyway. <laughs> um, there's this idea that's been long prevalent in social science circles called theory of change. Uh, that term of art actually goes, as far as I can tell, back to 1912. Bertrand Russell talked about it, and, and I'll pull one very small bit from Russell's article. He says, action, if it is to be of any value, must be inspired by some vision, by an imaginative foreshadowing of good things. In a word, action is built on contemplation. Okay? Uh, now, it actually turns out he was mostly talking about evolution. Uh, and things we would now recognize as adaptation versus natural selection and epigenetic influences. But within a decade, uh, the social scientists had 
taken over theory of uh, change, and there it has largely remained in management, it's taught in business schools, uh, in social science and behavioral science. And the general idea of a theory of change is um, you contemplate and articulate your desired outcome, you identify preconditions that have to exist before that outcome is achieved, you understand the context that those preconditions exist in or would need to exist in, and then you develop a plan of actions to undertake each one of those. See, it already sounds like I'm in business school or management speak, but actually, um, I think this is a very useful thing, and it's not something that scientists are typically taught. It's certainly on an undergraduate level. We do our research because we know how to do research. We don't plan out how the research connects to the wider world. Here are simple examples of theory of change. You know, I can show what it means by giving examples. So take an integrated, these are real uh, examples, kindergarten to grade 12 school system on the West Coast. Uh, there are too many dropouts uh, year on year, poor academic performance. And so the people in the school district decide what we want is we want the kids to be more engaged at school. We want them to see and experience the personal growth that's going on. We want them to develop cross age group peer support networks. And we also want to have safety nets. We want to have multiple points of contact for those kids so we know what's going on in, in their lives, um, uh, mentors. And the theory of change was developed was get everyone, as far as possible, in the school district involved in track and field. Okay? Track and field across the nation is basically a no-cut sport. Okay? You come out for it, you can do some event. Uh, it's both a team and an individual activity. And so the way that this theory of change work is one of the aspects on, on job applications for school teachers from kindergarten up to grade 12 is do you have any kind of athletic experience? It doesn't have to be track and field, any kind of sporting experience. Would you be willing to get involved in extracurricular activities and uh, in tie breaks uh, that, that, that's taken into consideration? And as a result, they implemented athletic training and preparation in gym classes and extracurriculars. Elementary school kids come to the middle school meets, middle school to the high school meets. And they are both a nationally famous location now for successful track and field athletes. And the school system has turned around and, and gotten much better school outcomes. Okay, another example over on the right, an institute of technology on the west coast was concerned that it's technically brilliant graduates are social and verbal morons. <laughs> it wanted to translate technical science and engineering expertise into real world influence and impact. Uh, famously, Fred Scheer said, science not communicated is science not done. Okay, and uh, so one of the things it did back in the 1980s was it started to require public presentation for every single undergraduate research project. It incentivized that with cash prizes. And now every first year undergraduate elective and every PhD first year class, um, somewhere there is science communication embedded in there. Okay, these are examples of theories of change. They're not really, I mean, a little scientific. These are more, uh, you can, you know, typical last 80 years kind of theories of change. Here is a theory of change diagram from the Newton Fund, which is run out of the United Kingdom's Department of Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. And this goes to show you can have a simple theory of change or you can make it somewhat complicated. I am not going to read this. It's full of buzzwords on buzzwords, although they are all exactly the kind of articulated things I, as a UK researcher, wanted the Newton Fund to be aspiring to do. And I think it probably did help them deliver at least a few aspects of, of, of what a government agency should do. And I have to credit them, this was their old theory of change. Here's the new one. And they said, this one is too complicated. <laughs> when my slides are online, you'll have a chance to look at this. But it includes such gems as enhanced international research networks and arrows going every which way. This is uh, not a good theory of change, and, and this is a, a better one. Okay. Um, here are links to actually what I think is a very nice, short, 10-page uh, uh, white paper, Understanding Theory of Change in International Development, that breaks down those really simple four steps to, to more individualized things that I think many scientists could do, whether you work in international development or not. And this paper is very honest about the pros and cons of theory of change. Pro, um, you know, we know the pros, but cons, besides the time you can sink into 
into wading through um, buzzwords is the ends tend to justify the means, right? We began by saying, what's the outcome you want? What are the preconditions? What are the actions to get there? And theories of change do often involve, this is a political science term, coercion, okay? Coercive change is, is a term of art. Uh, some people call it push sometimes, choice architecture, and, and this is inimical, in my opinion, to basic as well as academic values of free inquiry, dignity, freedom. So what I want to suggest today is it's time for science to start to articulate its own version of a theory of change. It doesn't have to be, uh, and it should not be, uh, as um, crass, perhaps, as political theories of change or, or, or as complicated as a social theory of change. In fact, I would say four easily implementable tips are keep it simple whether it's at an institution level or your own lab group, make it transparent. You should be able to put this on your website. You need to own your theory of change. Base it on a foundational value, okay? And uh, I'll explain what that means in a minute, but, but to make it work, by the time of an economist, okay, of an engineer and of a civil servant, by the time, rent a conference room and meet together with them. Bring along a colleague in your field and out of your field from your institution. That's the kind of way to start getting ideas from people out of academia and within and, and multiple different things. For instance, my personal theory of change, here's part of it, okay? Um, prosperity, freedom, happiness, all depend on natural resources. My research helps find, understand, develop, and protect natural resources. Therefore, the more people in the wider world appreciate the importance of natural resources, the better my research opportunities and impact will be. And now I will take a minute or two to practice that theory of change. Here are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Okay? We've heard a lot about these over the last couple uh, days, whether explicitly showing this graphic or not. And the more we commit to these sustainable development goals, the more we need to embrace mining and oil and gas drilling at a scale never seen before in the history of humankind. I truly, sincerely mean that. And I'm going to show you some examples. Okay? Everything requires mining and hydrocarbons. Plastics and chemicals, these are derived from oil and gas, heat it up and run over mineral metal catalysts. Metal catalysts have to be mined out of the ground. Medical devices, plastic tubing in hospitals, that comes from oil and gas. Lubricants in every machine that exists on Earth come from oil or poly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or silicon, which also is mined. Even if you get your silicon from used rice holes, you have to heat it up, and uh, that takes energy and carbon. Of course, metals, and we think of screws or the aluminum chairs we're sitting on, comes from mining, but it also requires heat and carbon coming from oil and gas and chemicals in order to fashion into product. Wind turbines, renewable energy. Wind turbine will rip down a steel mast. You have to strengthen that steel with niobium. There's not a lot of niobium produced in the world. If we want any fraction of the world to have as many wind turbines as Illinois has, the scale of niobium mining is, is incomprehensible. It's really, really huge. Concrete, you have to, you have, to have a, a foundation for every one of those windmill masts that involves a really big block of sand gravel heated up and added to other chemicals. Non-metals, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but you can begin to see even things you don't think require mining and oil and gas, like glass window panels or cloth impregnated with flame retardants that were dried from oil and gas, cut with shears, uh, and, and fit with metal machines. Every single thing requires mining. I had a colleague who would give a version of this talk who'd often say, unless you're sitting on a wooden chair, uh, in a wooden house, uh, you use uh, mining products. Truth is, even then, okay? Even wood is extensively modified. It's obviously cut with saws using electricity, heat and pressure stamped on machines, but it's also everything perfused with antifungal, anti-wetting, and anti-burning agents. Three of them, mainly copper, azole, you need the copper, that comes out of the ground in a mine, Azole is a structure you get from hydrazine and heat. Hydrazine uses sulfuric acid and heat. Sulfuric acid is produced from sulfur minerals and heat. 
If you don't want to use copper azole, you would then impregnate your wood with acetylation. Uh, that comes from, I won't go through it here, but involves many different metal catalysts, heat and hydrocarbon derivatives, or furfurylation, same thing. For heaven's sakes, they use palladium catalyzed furfural and or copper fertile catalyzed stuff, which comes from additional minerals and, and uh, uh, ethanol. Even fluorescent dyes, I added this yesterday because I've seen a lot of beautiful biological images, um, come from mining in oil and gas. Cyanine is produced by heat, dimethylformidine, piperazine, and iodide. Iodide comes from the brines on top of natural gas developments. Uh, the other things, again, involve carbon monoxide and ammonia. Carbon monoxide comes from the combustion of oil and gas, or coal. Ammonia comes from high-pressure gas with zinc and iron catalysts. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that doesn't come from mining and oil and gas. Life cycle analysis, cradle to grave, carbon budgeting, doesn't account for this. Absolutely inadequate. Um, I just want to show, you know, uh, I'm not the only person who's thinking about this in a resource landscape, both scientists and uh, nonprofits. Uh, here, people using mica for pearlescent uh, paints or for, you know, sometimes you see teenage girls with like sparkles on their face. That's actually little bits of mica. Um, it's the fifth most abundant mineral on Earth, but it's often mined by child mining uh, operations in India. Here is a very successful theory of change by an anti-child mining uh, charity, um, which the mining companies fully buy into. They don't want artisanal miners uh, bring bad reputational aspects or, 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 you know, they care about the local kids also. And you can read that later on the slides. So I want to ask you, can a theory of change work for you? Can you take it back to your institution as a lever of influence, go to your administration and say, you know, we should articulate something like this in the science we do. An institution should want to make a theory of change that does each of these things. And again, Catholic institutions are easy places to apply a value base to that theory of change. What about a governmental theory of change? The National Academy of Sciences of the United States does not have a theory of change. Shouldn't it and shouldn't the foundational value be something like free inquiry, pluralism, representation, these other things? Or a Catholic theory of change. Pontifical Academy of Sciences does not, as far as I know, have an explicit theory of change. What would it be based on? Something like humility, dignity, the kind of actions you'd take in going along to do your white paper or, or, or your scientific result. Uh, these are things that perhaps you all can bring back to your institutions. I want to say none of this uh, could have happened without wonderful students and colleagues at St. Andrews and other institutions over many years. Uh, in particular, Laura Bates at University of St. Andrews is, is, I think, one of the most excellent research and impact officers in the UK and, and probably globally in this space. Um, and I just want to remind you that, that you can use a lot of words to look fancy, and uh, by the end of my presentation, PowerPoint and its infinite arti artificial intelligence decide this guy is a mathematician. So it came up with this, it suggested I use this template. <laughs> which is just fancy looking nonsense. <laughs> so always let your brain be in charge of the fancy words and the complicated template that you bring to your science. And yet I hope it can be useful in, in that way. Uh, so the answer to my question, what makes a successful and unsuccessful project is hard work, good luck, and some careful planning. Thank you.